Good morning. I apologize for the delay. The train was a little slower than I thought. Um, good morning. My name is John Dickinson. I am the project technical lead for OpenStack Swift, and this is the most fun talk I get to give twice a year so far that is the state of the project and just looking at what's been, uh, what's happened over the last six months and what's coming and it's just been a really fun thing always to put together and so I'm really excited about it. Um, but first off, important thing I want to talk about is why. What's the why behind Swift and what's the vision behind it? And to me, this is, uh, this is key to what we're doing. And the first big thing to me is that uh, phrase I got from Tristan Good at Aptera is the concept of data sovereignty in the fact that everybody has data, it's always growing, and you need to have ownership of your, everything that touches your data all the way from hardware all the way down to your tool chain. And one of the big important parts of that is having a storage system that is storing your data that you can, uh, you can know what code is running, you can influence the direction of that code, you can even get involved in the community and the governance of that code and see what's going on. And that openness is incredibly important and it gives, um, it gives you the ability to take ownership of your data, which is who should really be having it. The second thing that I think that uh, is very important for me, at least, is my goal for Swift is to see that everybody is using Swift every day, whether they realize it or not. And this is something that I've said before, but uh, I, want, I want your mom to use Swift when she pulls up uh, a web page and when your kids go home to do their homework and they're looking up stuff on Wikipedia and they're using Swift. When you're pulling up bank records and when you're uh, just doing whatever you're doing in your day-to-day -day life, the storage system that can underlie that and the storing user data is, um, is something that is perfectly suited for Swift's use case and therefore you should be using Swift. Basically my, uh, my understanding right now of it is that if you're storing user data somewhere, you're building applications that are storing user data, you're uh, having to archive that, you're, you're, or warehouse all of that data, and you're not using something like Swift, you're doing it wrong. And the reason you're doing it wrong is because Swift is built for scale, it's built for availability, durability, and concurrency. And that using that sort of extremely wide use case of I've got, this mass, I've got these data sets that can grow from uh, relatively very small to very, very massive data sets. You need to have access to all of it and you need to be able to sustain access to all of that at, or any part of that at any time in a very performant manner. That is what Swift is built for. And so, we've had, uh, looking at how we've done this over the past six months and where we've come from, and I think we've made some really great progress. We've had some exciting um, uh, contributions in uh, to the code and I'll get to the community aspect in just a minute. But looking at some of the major features uh, that have been added into Swift uh, since the last time we were meeting down in San, San Diego. The first thing is something I specifically talked about uh, in San Diego, and that is global clusters. This is something that ev um, I've been asked about since Swift began. It's like, so I need to have my data stored in a very wide geographic area. How do I do this with Swift? And we've done a few things over the, over, the, um, over the lifetime of the project to make this a little bit better, and there's still some uh, effort to go. But we have done a, a very good job of uh, adding in these building blocks into the code base so far, and we've made a lot of progress over the last six months. So here's what we've specifically done uh, in the last six months. We have added in the... Um, the, the ability for you to change your replica count within your cluster, which is good for people using global or non-global clusters, but the important part here is if you imagine a global cluster and somebody has two regions now, you want some uh, additional durability in each of those. If you started with three replicas, now you've got a 2-1 situation, so you need to be able to change your uh, replica count so you can go up to, a say, a 2-2 for a total of four replicas. So this is something that's been added into Swift. It allows you to gradually uh, adjust your replica count over time for the entire cluster, so that you can go from uh, three, three replicas to four replicas um, on a live running, running cluster without any downtime. Another thing that's very important in figuring this out, uh, how, to, how to put these building blocks together, is uh, the ability to have different replica counts for your account and container, uh, your account, your container, and your object replica counts. 
And there were some things that were assuming in the code earlier that they were all uh, the same thing in generally three, but they could, uh, it could have been other things, but it was always assumed that, oh, well, if you got three uh, copies of your uh, container object, or your container, uh, then you're also gonna have three copies of the object. That limitation is no longer in Swift, and it allows you to have a more flexible deployment pattern. The next piece, which is uh, one of the most prominent pieces in uh, building global clusters, is the ability to support a region tier uh, when Swift is uh, deploying and uh, scheduling where your data actually lives. So in Swift, the data uh, is placed as uniquely as possible across your entire deployment based on uh, not just the drive that it's on so that you don't have uh, the same uh, multiple replicas stored on the same drive, but actually so that it will be spread out across different servers and then also those servers grouped into availability zones. And now those availability zones can be grouped into different regions. And still, if you have, say, four replicas and two regions, two zones each, and in those, you can imagine that uh, it, it, what, what's gonna happen right now is that you're gonna end up having a replica in each of those zones spread evenly across those, uh, that uh, region tier. And um, so that's one of the very important building blocks on getting global clusters done. The last piece, uh, the last building block that was merged in the last six months for, uh, that supports global clusters is a uh, affinity on reads. Uh, you want to not read over the WAN network if you're looking at uh, global clusters, uh, if you can at all help it. So um, one of the things that was added in is a timing-based affinity. And this uh, keeps track of what is the latency between your, uh, your, your proxy server that you're talking to and the different storage servers that are on the back end. And uh, being able to store this in a dynamic way means that your latency timings there can be a very good proxy for how far away those are. And um, then you, your cluster will respond dynamically to the current network conditions, including if one of those links there is over a wide area network. There's a couple uh, of things that we still have left to build. We've made some really great progress on this, We've got, but I'm gonna come back to those, um, those things in just a moment. But I wanna move on to some of the other really cool features that we've done uh, over the last uh, six months. Static large object manifests are uh, something that initially I was thinking, well, that's kind of a weird thing. Why would we want that? And as it was more explained to me, it, I, I realized it's actually really pretty cool. We've had the ability in Swift for a while to store data of an arbitrary size, arbitrarily large uh, objects uh, within Swift. But this was done based on container listings. And so your logical large object was dynamically created based on a subset of a container listing. And what this means is that you would chunk up your data and name it in such a way that, uh, let's say it all starts with, you know, my, my object is foo, slash one, two, three, four, and you, all, you know, enumerate all your chunks out there. And then when you requested that dynamic large object, it would go and return to you all of those chunks in order. It's a really powerful tool that offers you some really interesting uh, new use cases that even go beyond just uh, large objects because you can do interesting things by uh, pointing one object to another and uh, uh, opens up some interesting use cases. But it does suffer from the fact that you are relying on this container listing, which historically is something that's a little bit slower in Swift. So one of the, the uh, Rackspace developers uh, contributed this uh, uh, the static large object feature uh, so that you can create a manifest file that explicitly enumerates all of the different chunks. And that means that as soon as this uh, static uh, manifest file is uploaded, your, um, all of the chunks are verified to be available and to be correct according to their, uh, their hash and the hash of the contents. And at that point, your dynamic large object is immediately available. And even if your container listings in that uh, change over time, that uh, static large object will not change. And so one of the uh, advantages here is you get a little bit better performance as far as when your object is completely ready to be accessed by you. And um, it avoids that eventual consistency window that the dynamic large objects uh, is affected by. One of the other really interesting features that's uh, been a common request uh, over, over time from the community is the ability to do more than one thing at once with the Swift, uh, with the Swift endpoint. And so uh, we've added a, uh, a new feature into Swift that allows you to do bulk requests. 
And you can do both requests, either on creating new objects or on uh, deleting objects. Creating objects, you can upload a, an archive file, like a tar file, and it can be optionally encrypted. And when that tar file is, uh, gets to the Swift cluster, it is uh, expanded out into all of the, its constituent parts. So that, let's say you take a backup of a server or something like that and upload that tar, uh, you even stream that tar into Swift, then you are able to uh, access all of the things that were in that archive as individual objects directly accessible after the fact, which is really pretty interesting uh, feature, I think. Now, the co converse of that is being able to delete things. Um, deleting objects in Swift is something, of course, I don't ever want you to do because you need to grow your data storage requirements. But um, one of the things in Swift is that you can only delete containers, for example, when all of the objects are gone. You don't want to inadvertently blow out you know, a million uh, objects just by an inadvertent delete when you forgot to put in a slash or something like that. So um, that becomes troublesome, unfortunately, when you do really actually do need to delete a large chunk of data and you send a, end up having to send, you know, delete, 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 delete 10 million times, and that gets rather slow. And so there's a um, functionality now that you can send in a command that will aggregate a bunch of deletes into one, um, into one request from the client, and then uh, that, will, uh, be, um, that will be done on the server uh, before that the result is returned to you. And the limits on that, you know, obviously that could be open to abuse for deployers, so to protect against that, there are some limits. So by default, for example, uh, the limit, limitation is you can do a thousand deletes at once, and that's uh, configurable uh, for the deployer so they can change that uh, to meet your user needs. One of the other nice uh, features that's been added uh, in the last six months uh, into Swift is yet another thing that people have been asking for quite a bit, and that is the concept of quotas. Uh, quotas are somewhat of a complicated topic because they touch a lot of different things. These quotas that we have done inside of Swift are specifically uh, designed around the parts of Swift that Swift has knowledge about and can do things on. So, uh, and, and more, more directly, this is actually based on the uh, number of objects in a particular container or the aggregate bytes stored within, within an account or a container. And so there's two kinds of uh, quotas that we've added in. The first one is uh, container quotas, and this is something that a user can actually set on their own container. And this is useful for two reasons. One is because um, if there is, for example, a website that is uploading data directly into Swift, you don't necessarily want to, on the public internet, just let anybody who wants to upload anything they want to with no limitations whatsoever. <laughs> and so uh, as your repository of cat pictures grows, as they're uploading them into the Swift, your Swift cluster, then um, you want to be able to have some sort of limits on that. And so you can self-limit yourself, uh, your own container, as saying, I don't want to store more than 100 gigabytes within this container or something like that. You can also limit that by the number of uh, particular objects you have in that container. So I, I want to make sure that there are no more than 10,000 objects within this container or, or how, whatever you choose to set that as. The other really useful um, really good use case for this is uh, you don't want to, in, in reality, if, if you're not, uh, there's a cost associated with, the, with all of the data that you are storing in Swift, whether it's your own cost on hard drives or you're relying on a service provider to provide you uh, a Swift storage cluster. And in this way, uh, you, you, you may say that, great, Swift can scale really, really well. It can actually scale a little bit better than my pocketbook. And so I need to have some limitations on that so I can actually control um, my bill and have a little more expected uh, limits on that. And so that's container quotas. Account quotas are something that is uh, able to be set by an administrator on, uh, on the cluster. And this is something that's a little bit different, not a self-imposed thing, but you can now set up accounts and um, limit those to be no larger than a given number of bytes. And what this allows is in a shared infrastructure environment, um, perhaps where an, an IT organization where lots of different users or departments are needing to have access to this shared infrastructure, which, by the way, is a fantastic use case, case for Swift. Um, you want to be able to make sure that one particular user is not abusing the system beyond your, uh, your ability to add new capacity and things like that. And so you can set on your cluster, the, or on, your, on a particular account within Swift, 
the ability to, uh, or the, the limits on a, a particular number of bytes that they can store. So you can say, these guys only need to store 500 gigabytes within, the, within their, uh, all of their containers in aggregate. And uh, so these things, I think, will allow uh, deployers and users um, some very good tools to effectively manage their use of the Swift cluster. We've got a lot of great new features. Here's some more. Um, one of the uh, nice use cases, especially when you're thinking about uh, uh, user data, is that you can use Swift to directly store uh, data from um, web applications. In the HTTP spec, there is the uh, concept of an options verb, which we had not implemented, but basically it is a nice hook to say, the, the spec really loosely defines it as saying, this is a way that you can get some information about the resource you're, re you're requesting, so you can see what, what's possible on this. And so at a very, very uh, minimal implementation, basically you can do an options request to a particular object and find out, oh, I can do a get, a put, copy, delete on this, on this particular object. There is a draft spec uh, working its way through various, uh, various committees that is called uh, CORS. And CORS is a cross-origin resource sharing, I believe is the correct acronym. And it is something that allows specifically web developers to get around particular browser uh, security models. The browser will, uh, if you're running some client-side code in the browser, so in some JavaScript, the browser has a security model that says you can only uh, access domains that, or you can only access resources that are at your same domain that you're running at. Well, if, for example, your website is uh, looking at uh, www.whatever, but you actually need to upload your content to images.whatever, then your same origin uh, security model within the browser, browser is going to limit you to do that. So the core specification is a way for a web application developer to say, no, I actually trust these different uh, domains, and we are, uh, it will therefore bypass the uh, security model within the browser. And so we've spent uh, quite a bit of work uh, and uh, several uh, patches back and forth uh, to um, implement the core spec within Swift so that uh, web application developers can take advantage of this and use Swift more directly without having to proxy all of their content that is stored in Swift through their own web servers. And they can use Swift directly as an upload target, for example, and uh, a resource repository for their content. On the deployer side, there's a couple of really nice uh, new features that have been added as well. One of them is a better algorithm for choosing handoff nodes. And this is very important to deployers because as all deployers know, we all know, hardware fails. And Swift is gonna be able to work around that very well. But you want to make sure that your data still remains as available as possible. Going back to looking at one of the original, uh, one of the design goals of Swift itself is to remain highly available. And so it's very important that after you uh, exhaust your primary nodes or you discover that one of your primary storage nodes is, uh, for a particular object is no longer available, we need to make sure that that data gets it moved into an appropriate place. And so there have been some improvements in this handoff node selection that do two things. One, it makes a much better usage of the entire cluster and more evenly spreads out your uh, handoffs so that a particular node does not get overloaded when uh, you start having failures. It wasn't really too bad previously, but now it's just much better. Um, and secondly, what you want to make sure is that if you have failures, oftentimes this is going to end up uh, resulting in a deployer doing a change in the actual map of how the cluster is deployed in the ring file. You're gonna be doing ring rebalancings and things like that. But with the previous algorithm on the way handoff nodes were placed, this probably meant that the handoff node selection was going to get changed as well, which is actually somewhat of a problem, which means that if you've got a server down, so nodes have been, or data has been replicated to a handoff location, then that means that you've now taken something out of the ring, which maybe your handoff node now goes to a second handoff node that was different, which is now the first handoff node. And so it got a little bit of um, extra replication traffic when you were doing uh, uh, ring rebalancings in the case of failure, which as we all know is a common thing for uh, large clusters. So the new, um, the new uh, handoff node selection 
actually allows a much more constant, uh, more constant, can that be possible? Um, you can have a much more uh, reliable choice of how, uh, how the handoff nodes are selected so that even in the case of ring rebalancings, it's probably gonna, s it's extremely likely that it's going to still remain on that same node. And therefore, as a deployer, you don't have to worry about um, hardware and uh, ring changes causing extra replication storms or things like that. Another thing that's very nice for deployers is the ability to have configurable constraints. There were uh, several things within Swift that were just hard-coded constants in a file someplace. For example, the number of uh, the, the uh, largest object size, the length of an object name, the amount of metadata that you could store on a particular object, and, and things like that. And so that has been pulled out and is now set on a on a config file, and it then can be uh, configured to a particular deployment's re uh, requirements and even, if necessary, changed over time. And then there's the giant other category, because there's been a whole lot of other great stuff that's been coming along. And I don't have time to talk about all of the really great improvements that, that have been here. But just to highlight a few of these, um, we've got uh, support for custom log handlers, so you can integrate with some extra external uh, third-party log processing tools. Um, we've got the ability to uh, make uh, multi-range requests into a particular object, so you can request two different uh, sub-ranges of a particular object with one request. Um, we've done a lot of great improvements into the StatsD uh, metrics generation within Swift. Um, uh, things like uh, first byte timing, adding in timings for errors, um, some better uh, calculations of how often those things are generated. Um, and then there's the other, other, other category of things like uh, we've replaced WebOB as a dependency on our, in our code. We've uh, added the ability to run replication against a particular drive or a particular server to allow you to recover from errors much more quickly. Um, we've uh, added a lot of improvements in logging so that you can have a much more sane uh, log result when you're dealing with uh, middleware that can do extra requests like static web and uh, form post and, and things like this that a lot of people are using. So overall, we've had a lot of really great improvements over the last six months. I, I think we've made some really great progress in improving Swift, both for uh, use cases that people are actually using, the end users are actually taking advantage of, and also make some great efficiency improvements for uh, deployers themselves and uh, allowing people to more effectively run uh, clusters of all sizes. The great community aspect th that we've seen over the last six months is, is one of the most exciting things, I think, uh, because this is where you get into a little bit of just numbers games, but you get to see actually how much we're growing. And so um, over the last six months, we had 65 active contributors in, into Swift. 65 individuals uh, uniquely contributed a, uh, a patch into Swift that was merged. The really great thing about this is that the previous six months to this, we had 37. So we've seen some really great growth there. And that 65 uh, active contributors over the last six months out of a total of 109 that we're at as a small little subset. I'm going to call out Joe Gordon here for being the 100th contributor into Swift. So thank you very much, Joe. Um, he gets his free download of Swift. In those 65 uh, numbers, we have had a total of 31 uh, brand new contributors into Swift. And uh, here are their names, actually, let's see, my notes here. This compares to 19 um, in the previous six months of Swift. So we've gone from 19 new contributors to 31 new contributors, and we've gone to, from 37 total contributors to 65, just in looking at equivalent six month over six month periods. And what really is exciting to me about this is we have almost as many new contributors in this past six months as we had total contributors in the la entire last six months. These are the new contributors we've had. So if you see these people around, or you are one of these people, thank you very much. Um, it, is, it is through the, group, the, the effort of all of these developers and the companies that are paying them and contributing in their use cases, uh, their, their coding time and everything, that really uh, make Swift a, an awesome storage system. So thank you very much. I really appreciate all your work. Um, and to call out one person in specific, um, looking at, uh, I generally have done this in the past, a little bit of code golf, but um, the, the number one uh, contributor both in uh, number of patch, unique patches merged and number of uh, reviews that have been done on all of the patches in aggregate is Sam Merritt, um, one of our core developers who works at SwiftStack. 
and I'm very happy for his, uh, his uh, work, and thank you very much. <laughs> so where do we go from here? This has been a really exciting summit, not only just because there are so many new people that are coming in, but also there has been so, much, uh, si so many signs about um, how many people are actually deploying Swift and coming and bringing in their actual use cases and being able to have a packed room full of people at the beginning of this week in the design summit sessions talking about not let's learn about Swift, but actually let's take Swift to the next level because we've deployed it and now this is what we're seeing and we're gonna make it better. So where do we go from here? We've got a few things. Well, first, we've gotta finish up a few of the global clusters issues, uh, add in the last little building blocks of this. Um, one of which was extremely close, the first one listed up here, is to be able to segregate out your replication traffic onto a separate network. And this is going to allow deployers to more effectively manage their um, their particular um, uh, their, their traffic uh, for replication versus their traffic for clients. And especially when you're looking at a, uh, a global network and that uh, the coordination between these two clusters happening over a WAN um, likely to be metered in a different way than your internal network uh, as a deployer, then this is something that's gonna be very important to you so that you can ensure that you have the most cost-effective deployment possible according to your particular uh, needs. The last, uh, the last major building block here that we'll be uh, writing is the ability to do uh, affinity on writes. We've got the affinity on reads that we can get a, a close copy, um, more, uh, more likely than we've got, we're gonna get a remote copy. But we need to be able to do that on writes as well so that your write does not automatically go over the WAN and uh, rely on that connection to be up and uh, r increase latency based on that connection. So to be able, the ability to uh, write into a particular uh, region and have that rep uh, replicated there to get your full durability, but then asynchronously replicated over the WAN uh, to your other region is the last major building block. And so we're gonna be working on these. Uh, these are something, uh, things that I, I believe are coming very, very quickly, and I'm excited about um, being able to do this. So we would, again, as the community, um, it is you who make uh, these things possible and uh, make sure, ensure that they are built to meet your actual use cases. And uh, so I look forward to all of your um, contributions in that. The second major thing I wanna talk about as far as where we're going uh, forward is another thing that we were talking a lot about in our design summit sessions here. Uh, earlier this week. And this is specifically around uh, our API. And I'm really happy with the fact that Swift actually has a very stable API that actually predates Swift itself based on uh, where Swift came from uh, and replacing another uh, product at the time. But over time, we've added to the, the um, we've added to the API and we've added things that may or may not be optional. Uh, it's kind of hard, it had not been strictly defined. And there are, again, for some historical reasons and some just different people working on things, um, a few warts uh, that would be really nice to be polished out and, and made, made a lot better. But to do this, we've gotta do a few important things. And one of those is to figure out what actually is in that API? How does that work? Um, what, does, um, uh, what does that formal API look like? We've never actually come out and said, here's the actual formal spec for this is the Swift API. It's always been kind of a, an emergent thing from this is what people are actually deploying, so we can assume that this is what clients are gonna be writing against and, and you obviously just can't break things that people are using. So I expect there to be quite a bit of work over the next six months from a lot of people in the community on figuring out um, some of the base level things like uh, things we can pull from other pieces of the OpenStack community, like how do we do an API discoverability and, and versioning of that, and how do we make that a consistent uh, story across all of OpenStack? We wanna be able to figure out um, how do we, uh, what sort of things are we going to be polishing? What sort of things do we need to be changing? Um, how, do we, how can we ensure that these changes are not going to break the many, 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 many uh, end users who are using Swift clusters deployed throughout the world? And how do, we, uh, how do we go forward in a sane manner to say this is what the API and this is what isn't? So I'm looking forward to a lot of work there. I think there's a lot of questions, but it's something that uh, can only really be answered not by any small subset of people, but actually the community as a whole coming together. 
The last thing I want to talk about with LFS is uh, something that, again, there's still a lot of questions about, but it's a very interesting idea. And uh, it's not entirely new within the Swift community. We've, it's been talked about before, but uh, LFS. LFS stands for Local File System, and it's generally just become a catch-all term within the Swift community to say, how can we optimize for particular um, uh, types of storage on a Swift cluster? And let me give you an example. Right now, we are assuming that you are using a POSIX file system to store your actual object data. And we're recommending in our docs, but there's no restriction on this, that you use XFS. And so, for example, within the auditing um, functionality within Swift, we take advantage of some particular XFS-isms uh, to accelerate some auditing passes and things like that. I think this is really great. I'm a big fan of XFS. It's been really, really good. And I don't expect people to stop using XFS at all. However, we can't go in and make very XFS-specific changes that end up breaking it for people who are running on other file systems. And so being able to abstract that out so that we can make an XFS-specific one, a generic POSIX one, or even something else that comes up that is a different file system that has particular semantics or even a different storage medium that looks different than using a traditional file system but still provides really good uh, use case for Swift is something that would be very, very interesting. And there's a second place where you can look at this is um, the, the communication between the proxy and the storage nodes and figuring out how to abstract this in a very clean way so that the communication there um, can take advantage of, of some um, other things that people are working on in the community. I think there's still, like I said, a lot of questions around this, and uh, I think we can easily go too far one way or the other as far as um, trying to embrace too much and biting off uh, too much and not being able to actually digest that within the community and within the code base. But at the same time, I, I definitely want to avoid uh, pushing away too many people as well and saying that, no, this is the one true way you have to do things. Um, we've got a large growing community with lots of people doing lots of very interesting things with very diverse needs. So let's figure out how we can best uh, interact with all of those people to make, um, in a lot of ways, if you're talking to an object storage system, you need to be speaking Swift. And this is the, the using the Swift API. And being able to uh, do these sort of things internally in the code is something that's really going to accelerate that, I think. The last major thing I wanted to talk about as far as uh, improvements and where we're going forward for Swift is particularly uh, things that are attractive to developers, but ultimately end users as well. And these are having to do with uh, efficiency improvements. And there's a few ways you can think about this. First, you can think about it as just latency on request for end users. Users want faster reads and writes, so let's make those faster. Number two, you want to be able to, deployers want to be able to spend less money on hardware. And so how can we make sure that you have a very, very nice spindle to core ratio so that you can get extremely dense storage nodes on extremely wimpy CPUs. Um, there are certain, certain parts of Swift right now uh, that are actively being improved. For example, replication, which right now are rather chatty protocols and have particular uh, requirements. Well, if we can make those better, um, which is currently in progress, then uh, we can allow people to use uh, better things. I, you know, just as a weekend project, I, you know, I put Swift on a Raspberry Pi. I don't recommend running that in production. But uh, it was still a fun thing is how, how much can we actually cram, uh, cram Swift down. And you know, I performed rather poorly, shocking. Um, but I, we need to make these things go uh, work really well for a lot of broad use cases. And um, the other thing that is going to be uh, specifically done is um, looking at improvements on how we actually talk to the, to the storage medium itself. How do we talk to drives? Um, you know, getting into the extremely technical details on this, uh, it's a big problem when you're dealing with massive concurrency and things like this, but dealing with asynchronous I.O. on the drives. And it's rather poorly implemented in Linux all the way up through Python and EventLint. So we need to make this better. And this is something else that's actively being worked on right now. There's some proof of concept patches for both of these uh, out there. Uh, for example, to improve, uh, to implement a thread pool for just your disk uh, talking. Um, we had quite a few presentations at the beginning of this week, which were just fantastic, on people benchmarking Swift and uh, sh sharing their results and showing where some of the bottlenecks were and how we can uh, make those things better. 
um, both from the client perspective and saying that, oh, okay, I was trying to uh, throw a bunch of things and my clients got slower as, you know, as one particular drive got bad. And then we also had some uh, great uh, feedback from Seagate, looking at it from the drive up and saying that, what is actually the drive seeing? How many, how many actually drive operations, you know, abstracting away the kernel and the file system and all that, but what is the drive actually doing? And there's gonna be some great follow-ups on that as well, but the, the long and the short of it is that um, while Swift has pro proved to be remarkably good, especially for these very broad long tail use cases, um, and, and being able to effectively store uh, large numbers of objects, large concurrency and things like that. There are some very good improvements we can make that will affect both you know, the hardware that you can deploy on and make that uh, cheaper for you, and also uh, the end user experience and making that better for everyone else. And so uh, to sum up, the, the three things that I think uh, are really in, uh, important going forward is figuring out um, uh, the improvements on the API coming together as a community there, um, improvements on the efficiencies, and then also uh, fin finishing out the global clusters and uh, letting people effectively deploy those. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this. I'm really looking forward to those numbers getting a lot bigger over the next six months. And I think that's something we can all do together. So I think we have a few minutes for questions. Five minutes maybe? Um, I'm not sure on the time check. One minute, One minute left, One minute. okay. Thank you very much. I will be around. I'm flying out tonight, but I'll be around today. We've got some workshops later uh, that I'll be a part of specifically around Swift. Um, we've got a Swift book out now, which is really kind of cool. And uh, I think Clay has a, a few copies here if you don't have one yet. Um, so I look forward to your continued involvement. Thank you very much, and uh, have a good day.